So um, Janine and I were talking um, about different things that are going on with our business, um, listings, showings, everything, all of the above. And we kind of backed it down to when we first started and how we knew absolutely nothing. And um, a lot of our stories, <laughs> I know you guys look at us like, are you kidding me? Did that really happen? And when is that gonna happen to me or will it not happen to me? So what we decided is when we first started, the first time that you went up to a house, we knew nothing at all about showing a house. I knew what I was looking for. I didn't know what my buyers were looking for, why they were looking for it, how they were looking for it, what it meant to them. And it really didn't matter what it meant to me, even though you always think in your mind, well, they're going to like it because I like it. So what we were talking about doing is starting, and I know some of you people are going to go, oh yeah, we've done this so many times. We know what's going on. But we're going to really, really back it up and go through how to show a house and really, really what to tell people and what not to tell people, how to fill out your feedback. I know Charlie has been saying, you know, fill out your feedback, fill out your feedback. Obviously he keeps bringing it up because people aren't doing it. It is your job to do the feedback. And I'm going to rant for just like 30 seconds. It is also your job to have, and I know everybody here has it because we make you have it. Um, Century Lock. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get. Oh, can I have a one-day code for Century Lock? Can I have a one-day code for Century Lock? It's your damn job. Get right. certified in Century Lock. It's it's your job. So, well, I haven't gotten to it yet, or we don't do that. Well, you should. And as a listing agent, it's one thing that we shouldn't have to do is to right. chase people around to get them Century Locks. And I had one the other day. I gave her a code. She still couldn't figure the damn thing out. Yeah. To the yeah. point that... And of course, I wasn't available to meet her there to show her. I had to figure out and find the seller, which kind of made me look like the ass, to get the garage code to get these people in. So you have to do things and prep. I know a lot of times a showing is only 30 minutes out of your day, but you really need to prep before you do that showing to make sure that you're ready to do that. So Janine and I were going to go through um, some of the different things on how to prepare for a showing and how to show a house because there are things that should be done that will really put your buyers at ease. And um, I had an inspector tell me once that, you know, something wrong with the house should never make a deal fall through because everything can be fixed. Depends on how much money you want to spend on it. So what we think is very, very expensive may not be for them. Yeah. And, yeah. and this market is really, so I know how from listing agents prior to it going on the market, it was in delayed. I paid the appointment. I had a really interesting phone call yesterday, which kind of blew me away a little bit. Um, she called me and she said, I'm so excited for you to show my listing on Friday. Um, we had a pre home inspection that's going to be on file. So that will, that will eliminate having a home inspection on the offer. And I went, hmm, okay. She said, they did know that there needs to be some foundation work. Um, and I said, okay, so then you had somebody come out and look at the foundation? Well, no. So I think what she was saying is, you know, she set it up for these, these agents to assume that they're going to be, they should be writing an offer without having that foundation inspected. So, Janine, how much does it cost to have a foundation fixed? It depends on, and that's the thing. I don't know. I mean, yes. I, I did they measure the walls? And she said, well, no, but they look like they're maybe three quarters of an inch out of plumb. Okay, you guys, red flag. Um, if that were my listing and I did a pre-home inspection and that showed up, then the first thing I would do is have you know, a, a basement specialist come out and measure those walls. So then we have a report on file. Um, so already- So Janine, does it cost yeah. anything to have um, somebody come out and look at those basement walls no. and give an estimate? No, nothing. So nothing. I know out here we have Ein and I also like Gatish. So those are the two that I go between. Um, they're quite responsive because they know that we're a good company. Um, and they come out and they will do a free inspection and give you a quote of what that basement costs. And if those sellers and the, and the seller's agent already knows that there's a problem, 
this is something that you should really take that extra step and get that information for them. Right. I've seen, so, um, go ahead. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. <laughs> I've seen basement repairs everywhere from um, $5,000 to $50,000. So $5,000 we can negotiate, $50,000, I don't know about you, but I have a couple of new home buyers that I'm working with and they don't have the extra $50,000 to, fi to fix a basement. So it's something, that's a lot of money. Yeah, so I even am tempted to see if I can have a basement person come with us to that appointment and measure that wall and give us an estimate of how much that would cost. Because mm -hmm. we only have one opportunity to get out of that house. Not anyway, I got off track, but I just thought that was a very interesting scenario. So when I'm showing that house, I need to be prepared for that. So go. So now we'll talk about preparation for showing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So go ahead, Connie. I don't. I mean, I don't want to accept you. So um, when you find the houses, let's start all the way from the beginning to setting your appointment times. So when you're working with buyers, and let's say you have three houses um, to show those buyers in. Uh, MLS, through showing time, you can set up a tour. Does everybody know how to set up a tour? Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to back this right in because I've had many people say, well, I set up one at a time. If you set up your tour, it tells you how long it takes in between homes, which is actually really cool. Um, would I be able to share my screen, Janine? And I'll just, I'll zip through it real quick. Yeah, yeah. Let me just pull up MLS here. Yeah, um, I had one of the newer agents um, show a couple of houses for me and I said, I'll just send you the tour. He says, what is that? I've never seen it before. And unless if, yeah, it's just one of those things. So let me see. Um, am I in? Yeah. Okay, so when you're in MLS, let's just, I'm just going to grab the hot sheet real quick. And this isn't going to be a tour that you're going to set up because I'm just going to take the top three properties. And what you'll do is, um, actually, I'm going to take the top two properties and pull this in here. Come on. Can you see at the MLS page that I'm on? Yeah. You're not sharing time. <laughs> okay, I can't hit the share button. Yeah, my share was not uh, working either. <laughs> that picture. Let me try it one more time. Yeah, the share button is not coming in. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I can just walk you through right away. Um, when you set up, when you pull up an MLS page, there's a showing time tab on the top. Click that showing time tab. And on the very bottom of the showing time page, when it opens up, there's a tab that says schedule a single showing or add to showing cart. When you click on add to showing cart, it brings up a calendar for your tour. So you click on the date, select your buyer's name, and hit OK. That listing that you were that you had open when you went into showing time will automatically come in. There's a line that says appointment information. It says enter listing IDs. All you have to do is put in um, your MLS numbers. With those MLS numbers, when you hit go, it'll add to your tour. When you add to that tour, it tells you how many miles and how many minutes in between your showings. Now, keep in mind, <laughs> you need to configure your drive time when you're doing your showings. So I just took one in Brookfield and one in Wisconsin. It's telling me it's 22.6 miles in between your showings at 31 minutes. At this point in time, you can pick a time 
for your first showing, for your second showing, for your third showing. Once you schedule this, it'll automatically set up your showings for you and it'll put it on a map. And you can also share that. You can email it, you can print it to your buyers so they know where you're going. It's actually, it's, it's pretty slick. So um, do that before you set up your drinks. Make sure you have enough time in between for drive time. Make sure you have enough time to show the properties. And sometimes people go through a property in 10 minutes. Sometimes they go through it in an hour. So you have to know your buyers at this point in time. Are they ones that like to lag through a property? And also keep in mind that you're on a schedule. So tell them we're on a schedule. If this isn't the house, let's move on. Because some of them still mm -hmm. like to go see every single room and check out every single kitchen cabinet. And if they don't like the house, just, just keep it, keep her moving, keep her moving. Okay. So set up that tour before you go. The next thing you want to do is, um, Janine, what do you do for bringing information to your buyers? Yep. So I have the history of the um, listing. So I pull the history. Um, I pull the condition report. Mm -hmm. And I pull the, the MLS sheet and <coughs> with it and I staple it all together. And so you print them all out? I print them all out. And then I write on mine the lockbox code if it's century lock. And then I number them one through four. And then I have the times that oh, I have. Me water. Lashante, can you hit your um, mute, please? Or can you mute her, Janine? Um, yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. So, okay. um, so then I print everything out. I have the history. I even sometimes go as far as in that history, if there's a previous condition report, I will print that out and compare it to their current condition report. Um, I have the, the tax evaluation, the tax information with it. I have pretty much everything there because I want to be loaded with information if they ask me now. It could be that you walk in and walk out, they're not even interested, but if they were, I have yep. all of it with me. Yep. So I have it numbered with the times, the code, the history, the condition report, any documents locked and loaded, I'm ready to go. Because not yep. all the time are you gonna walk into a listing and they're even going to have any information in there. I mm -hmm. see that a lot. So yep. um, be prepared. Be prepared. <clears throat> I'll know. Yep, if, yep. I'll know if they're presenting I, options at a certain day and time. I'll have everything wrapped up. Correct. So what I do is I print out um, the MLS sheet. Two of them. I print out the private in black and white, and I print out the public MLS in color. So I don't give them the wrong one. That just makes things easier on me. So on yeah. the black and white one, I also do the same thing. I write the combination code because once you get to that house, maybe the internet doesn't work. So you wanna make sure that you have that combo code written down. Um, I write the tax assessment, not that it makes a difference, but then I know where we're sitting. I print out the record, the real estate condition report, if there's something on it. If not, I put on the bottom of my sheet, clean record. Yeah, because then I know. And when you're doing multiple houses, you'll get them mixed up. On my sheet, a lot of times, I mean, I know where things are, but if there's something special on there or important, I'll highlight it just so I can say, I mean, and when, in the beginning, do me a favor and highlight the taxes because everybody will ask you the taxes. Highlight the year the house was built. Also write down on there when it sold last and how much it sold for, because they're going to ask you. And, and these are all the, and the square footage, yes. Highlight that square footage. If, it, if you need to, highlight the, how many bedrooms and how many baths. Also look in that square footage, look a little bit deeper and you can pull this up on the tax record. If it says total square foot, Make sure you know the square foot above ground and below ground because many agents do not put above ground and below ground because it makes it look like more square footage. Right. right. So make sure you know the above square footage and the below square footage if there's finished off space. I agree. Anything else you highlight with yeah. that? Um, I always, if I have 
occupiers that are looking at several properties, I always say, especially in the winter, make sure you have shoes on that you can easily take on and off. I swear <laughs> to God, there's always that one that has these really tough shoes to get on and off. And it's an issue, you know, and they have to sit down, untie. So I'm like, put some clip-ons because we're going to be running quick. Um, and That's regardless great. if they are your customer or your client, this is my line. I open up the door. I have my facts, but I shut my mouth. Yep. Let them experience that home on their own without you piping in their ear about everything and anything, let them experience it. And if they ask you questions, then answer them. But I always say, just keep your mouth shut. Um, yep. They don't- And with all, this, you know, all this information that you have, yeah, don't give it to them unless if they ask. Right. Yep. Uh, backing up, I'm gonna keep backing up just a little bit. When you're going on your showings also, keep in mind the season. I, it's funny because I have a video that, of course, my daughter put out there because, you know, she does my marketing for me of me tromping through the snow, five acre property. And I had my big sorrel boots on up to my knee. Guess how high the snow was? Mid thigh. <laughs> so in the winter, for ladies who wear heels, for men who wear nice shoes, keep a pair of boots in your trunk because you will be trekking one, three, and five, and sometimes 20 acre parcels. Keep a hat, keep a pair of gloves. I know this sounds really, really, really silly, like mom is talking to you, but keep all these things in your trunk just in case. Frozen a few times, keep an umbrella. Yeah. There you go, yep. And if you're at a showing, if like I had three showings on Sunday or something like that, and my people who are typically pretty slow lookers, you're going to find out if they're slow or fast. They yep. zipped. So I was way ahead schedule. So here I had like 20 minutes in between and, or 30 minutes. And I mean, my second appointment was done. My first appointment was done in five minutes. So that kind of threw me off. So what I did is I called that listing agent and I said, Hey, um, I'm running ahead of schedule. What does it look like if I came to now? Sometimes they won't answer. Um, but she said, go ahead and go in. And we, you know, so you just have to kind of read it and you don't know how long your buyers are going to look, but if they are slow lookers and you have them on a schedule, I always say, cause I have a few that will just drag it out. Um, I'll say, okay, I just want to let you guys know, we only have 20 minutes in this house. So let's really take a good look at it quickly. If it's something that you're really interested in, um, then we can come back and take a look at it again, but we only have 20 minutes and they don't allow overlapping showing. So we have to be mindful and take a look and get out. That kind of moves things along because you may run into a buyer that is, you'll have them that are looking at every, which, and then you find out they're not even interested in it. And you're like, oh my gosh. So kind of move the process along as you can. Read the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions so far? And you guys can put it in the comments on, before you go to that showing on what to prep. So make sure that you have in hand an MLS sheet with the facts, know the taxes, know the square footage. No, the year the house was built, look at that real estate condition report and any supporting documents. If there are HOA um, papers for the subdivision, they will ask you if they can put up a pool. They'll ask you if they can put up a fence. Can I put up a dog kennel? I mean, they come up with some of the most interesting questions. If there are HOA papers for the um, asso or association papers, surveys, Pull that up and know what's going on. I mean, you can always say, I will look into that, but you look much better if you are prepared before going into this. Um, another thing that I have on my phone, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, especially when you're out in the country, it's an app called OnX Hunt. 
It's a hunting app, O-N-X-H-U-N-T. It's red with an X on it. Now you have to pay for it. I think it's $5 a month, $60 for the year, but I cannot tell you how many times I use that app. So here it is. Where are we? Do, 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 do. Way on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Cool. This is worth every cent you pay for it. So when you tap it, it tells you, and let me just pull it up real, real quick here. When you tap it, it brings up the map. See all those red lines? Yeah. These are the properties and the property lines. As you walk, you can walk right along those property lines. I love it. So you know where the property is. Like I said, when you're when you're in the city, when you have your cute little square lots and everybody has a fence, it's okay. But when you're working and walking your lo your larger parcels out here, this is something that A makes you look cool, B gives you all the information you need, and actually when you tap on it, it'll tell you who owns the property. So you can see if you're working larger properties or, or farm properties, if that farmer has split the property, if he owns the parcel next to it, if there's an option to maybe purchase that. I mean, you have to have all these things going on in your mind. So, and this is the one thing that we wanted to show you guys that when you want a property, you always have to be thinking who owns the property next door. If I want to expand, could I buy the neighbor's property? Well, if it's the same owner, there's a pretty darn good possibility. Or if you look in there and it's in an estate or in a trust, you know, you can always contact them and move forward. That's, I love that. Oh, it's an amazing. And um, hunting guys think you're the coolest when you pull it up because yeah. they have that app. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. And, and what this is all doing is it's, it's building, um, building confidence in your buyers that you know what you're doing. Even though you guys are all under five, most of you are under five contracts, this gives you, you know, that extra ammunition that you know what you're, what you're doing and what you're talking about. So Connie, what if you are asked to show properties um, for another agent? What is that person's responsibility as a showing agent? Okay, so um, showing other properties for other agents, keep in mind that you are not the buyer's agent in that point in time. So it's just like if you did not have a buyer agency, you have to keep your mouth shut. Always refer back to, you know, Janine, Janine, can you get back to you on that? Take notes. Always have a pen in your hand. On the back side of that MLS sheet, I make notes all the time. Because if you're going to see more than one property, two properties, three properties, four or five, if they're out of town, if you're getting them all in one day, you're going to forget what property was what. And I'll put on the back of the property, house with tree wallpaper because then I'll know what house that was or what they liked about that house. Remember, you really liked the size of that kitchen. You wanted to paint the cabinets, but the size of the kitchen was definitely there for you. Make notes on there. Because you're not that buyer's agent, make those notes and give them to that buyer's agent who you're covering for. After that showing, call them right away and say, hey, John and Lisa love this house. John and Lisa did not like this house. And then give those details. So the bathrooms were small. The kitchen was great. They loved the kitchen. They loved the white cabinets. White cabinets are definitely a must for them. They didn't like the basement. It scared them. The lot was too big. The lot was too small. They liked the swing set in the backyard. You know, anything that they mention, forward that on to that buyer's agent because it that's where you're you're the you're the eyes for that buyer's agent because they aren't there. And if you're helping them out, they will help you out. I know with a lot of things, you know, if you're double booked and once in a while we do have to go on vacation, we do need help. And you guys will need help also. And we're here to help you guys when you go on your vacation. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, um, Coco here went, uh, helped another agent who was on vacation, took a video when she was walking through a couple of important pictures, what the buyers either liked or did not like, 
and then sent it over to her. Um, so she knew exactly what was going on. And that's great. it was, yeah, that's, it's a great idea. And you know what? Everybody has smartphones now, so it works out real nice. Before we move forward, is there anyone that's on here right now that has a question or an experience that they wanted to share about showing property that you may have learned that you may want to share with the rest of the class? Bridget? <laughs> well, <laughs> showing a lot of buyers. I always panic when I have to open the door. Why is it so scary? Um, I was joking with Catherine, like when your buyers ask if they can use the bathroom, it kind of makes me nervous. Um, I know it's silly, but I of course just assume the worst is going to happen. I don't know. Like the water shut off? Or yeah, that's break a good toilet. point. <laughs> that happened to me a month ago. I had someone use the bathroom without telling me and the water was shut off. Uh huh. Oh, no. Uh, that was a tough one um, I am not so good at like the mechanicals I don't even know what I, I can't believe people like trust me as a realtor I don't even know I'm like are you the slump pump are you the first is this why is, yeah. why is that so hard for me and like the ages of them and that kind of thing um gives me some trouble so that's a really good point. And I had the same thing. Honestly, you guys, I didn't know the difference between a hot water heater and a furnace. I hate to admit. Um, so I learned all of that by shadowing and going to home inspections. And I literally had to have an inspector point everything out. Um, and this is the thing too. If you don't know, you just don't know. Um, mm -hmm. You just I don't know, and I'll have to get back to you. Don't act frazzled. It's not your house. So I used to worry about the little things, and I still may not know those those things that are asked to me today that I thought I had to know seven years ago. Um, if you don't know, you don't know. Just say, you know what, we'll find out. Because nine times out of ten, it's probably not the house they're going to put an offer on anyway. So just don't knock yourself out to think you have to know everything you're not until you need to so yep. yeah yeah it's okay to say i can get back to you on that yep. or jenny get back to you on that but have a pen and write things down because when you're going and when i started i'm like oh i'll remember this well by the fifth house i didn't remember anything from the first house because you're trying to be so attentive to those buyers and you're like, and then they'll say, well, that first house, you know, do you remember that window in the kitchen? I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but no. when they say, it's okay to make notes. Um, I usually just take, you know, the papers with me. I've seen people with clipboards, which I love I'm getting a clipboard. You know how you learn as you go along, I'm getting a clipboard because otherwise, once you set something down, you may lose it. Um, another thing, when you go into a house, when you go into a house, ones with lock boxes, not sentry lock. Take that panel. Some of them have that little panel on it. Set it on the ground outside the house. Don't carry it around with you because it's a dime to a dollar that you will set it down somewhere and lose it. It'll take you an hour and a half to find that damn front of that lock box when you set it down somewhere that you don't know. So I always take it off and I set it on the ground right there. Um, depending on your neighborhood, I leave the key in the front door. Out here, it's not a problem. Leave that key in the front door. I had a new agent who had to pay to re-key the house, all of the locks because they were all the same because she lost the key. It wasn't in her pocket, it wasn't in her purse. She doesn't know where she set it down. So put that key I know it sounds silly, but no. we've all we've all lost a key. I leave it right in the front door. And with back-to-back -back showings, when that next agent comes, tell them the key is in the front door. Do you mind if I leave it there for you? So keeping that communication open with that other agent also, because when you walk in, you're gonna set it down somewhere and forget where you put it or what pocket. And when you're on a schedule to keep going through houses and you have lost that key, 
you're going to be so flustered. It's going to, it's really not fun. Maybe it's yeah. happened to me. It's happened. It definitely yeah. has. If it is a sentry lock though, um, I, I think this is important to bring up. Um, if there is another agent waiting to get in and you have that sentry lock open and the key is in the door, I put the key back in the sentry lock because it's registering me that I have returned that key. Otherwise, the person behind you may walk out with the key and according to the sentry lock, you have not shut that sentry lock box. So I always tell the agent behind me, I'm going to go ahead and put the key back in here into the sentry lock um, because obvious reasons. Um, another thing is my biggest challenge when I started was getting doors open with the key. Yeah. Um, especially here. I don't know if it can be seen out there, but a lot of these keys and white are on, all the old ones. really hard. And I would have to call Jay or somebody like, I can't get this key to work. So my advice to you is this, they usually work, but you're gonna have to put everything into your hands besides the key down. Like you can't hold on the papers mm -hmm. and then try to get, you literally have to put everything down and you're gonna have to maneuver it carefully. Um, that is so frustrating and of course you're being watched by your buyers and they're standing there like what's the problem and then i'll say i can't seem to get the key to work you want to try yeah. <laughs> I mean, I that so you know those are just yeah. little things. The, old, the older doors sometimes you have to pull them at the same time sometimes you push them at the same time sometimes you have to turn the knob a quarter of a turn as you're turning the key those old locks and doors especially in Tosa. I don't know what it is with Tosa, but yes. I've had more problems with doors in Tosa than anything. I, I thought of one thing too. Um, someone did this to me and I was really annoyed, but now I do it. If you are on time for your appointment and they're not allowing overlapping appointments, you lock that door. There is nothing worse than being in the basement. And all of a sudden you hear like the next people upstairs and your buyers kind of give you this look and you look stupid. And then it's awkward when you pass the other people and just lock it. It's only probably going to be 15 minutes anyways. They can wait outside. But then Good. come out on time. <laughs> Cause I've had that happen to me where they were in the house like 10 minutes longer overlapping into my showing and they locked the house on me and I was really frustrated. I'm like, well, I don't have all day. Be right. my time. So be <laughs> I would say like when you do it, make sure it's during your appointment time and not yeah, into someone else's. So to you guys, there's that ring doorbell and those sellers are watching every single move that comes to their front doorstep. They can see you walk up the sidewalk. They can hear you. So be very careful of how you act. Also, assume that there are cameras in that house. Assume it. So if you want to have a private conversation with your buyers, take it outside. Take yes. it outside. I, I They should disclose that there are cameras, but they don't. I always assume, and I tell my buyers, assume that there are cameras in this house. There's yep. a nanny cam. Yep. You don't I've had a seller. Them. Yeah. I had a seller who said, if this agent puts an offer in with those buyers, I'm not accepting it because I was listening to them at the front door. Yep. Yeah. I don't know what they said. I don't know. I don't want to know what they said, but he was adamant that if they put an offer in, he, they were not going to accept it nor work with that um, agent. So... Yeah. To, to what Janine said, and people watch. It's their house. I yep. have a quick question. Don't start negotiating about the negotiating the offer in that house because they could be listening to you. So I always tell my buyer, we're going to assume their cameras. If there's a ring bell, we have to be very careful. We're going to discuss anything out by the car and leave it at that. Yeah. Catherine, did you have something? Yeah, I have a quick question. So a lot of us started our careers in real estate like during COVID where 
you know, there weren't overlapping showings. It wasn't, you know, multiple showings at a time. So now that we're in, like, we're in more of a competitive market, it's kind of seems like a free for all to me, at least where it's like, it's like a garage sale, like you or an estate sale where you just walk through the house. And so, I mean, my approach has always been like, if I have the key, I locate the agent, but there have been cases where the agent just leaves the key on the counter, doesn't even find a, the other agent. So like from A, is that nor in like a normal market, is that type of uh, showing environment normal? And two, what is the best, like for our fiduciary, what is the best practice for us and like handing off that key, do we need a business card? Do we need to validate like who they, who this agent is? You know, I just feel like there's just a level of security when there are multiple showings going on at once that just is not happening right now. That really concerns me from a, if I were the seller's list or if I were the listing agent, but also as a buyer's agent, you know, it's just kind of a free for all. So what is the best practice? And like, is this normal? If I take key out of the lockbox, then I put the key back in the lockbox. Okay. Plain and simple. If I'm handing it to someone, if it's not an, a century lock, I want their business card and I want to know who they, who they are. Okay. I don't trust. I mean, I think, you know, in my little tight community, after a while you begin to know who these people are, but um, I don't trust, I don't trust anyone. I am empowered with this key and I'm, you know, I got to take care of it. As far as overlapping showings, we didn't really have that going on pre-COVID anyway here. Um, it is one at a time. We scheduled a private showing and it's your time to show it. There are always going to be those incidences though where you walk in and you have these scheduled time and it is made. What I tell my buyers is keep your mouth shut. Honestly, don't have any opinion. Let's go through the property together, and, um, and then if we have any questions, let's take it outside. We're not going to show a high level of interest or disinterest. We're kind of going in there with a poker face because um, it, it could set off another buyer to watch your language, and you just don't want to give anything away. It sounds ridiculous, but. Um, it's going to be more and more of that as things start to subside with the pandemic and then the lack of inventory. I think we're going to see more of an overlap. But we, yeah, it's, we have the time to tell the 12 30. Janine's. Yeah. Janine, it's hard to hear you. You're really echoing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because somebody, I'm going to put somebody on mute. There was somebody in the background. Okay. Is that better? There you go. That's better. Maybe you're a yeah. little bit too far away. We want to see your face a little closer. Okay. Can oh, there you go. Much it? better. Okay. All right. So, what's another question? Uh, an experience or something you guys have come across? Anybody? I, I, I just want to touch on the um, the key. I've had agents where I've asked them to register the key box and they get snotty with me. What do you mean register the key box? Like, like an overlap showing, they want me to hand them the key and I tell them, no, I'm going to put the key back in. You have to register the box. Yeah. And they get, I, all the time I tell people that whether well, it's a lock box or if it's a century key box, I tell them they need to register it. And there are some agents out there that just roll their eyes and get so snotty about it. And your job. Not, you're doing your job. You're doing your job. Okay. I always feel like regard if you know the agent. Yeah. You are the number one uh, thing is the seller and how you want to develop a real estate agent. Is it's doing it again. Yeah. You're echoing. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's someone unmuted. No. Bless you. Is that better? Okay. Connie's muted now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So 
Okay. That's interesting. So, um, Garen had gone to a showing and it was the wrong lockbox combination. So he called the listing agent and got the right lockbox, but he said the people before him had the correct lockbox, which is odd because when you set up showing time, you put the lockbox and all of that information in and it, the same thing gets sent to every agent. So yeah, that's weird. And then they changed the lock box, and yours was the original one that was sent out before they changed. No, they changed. Well, right, they, they could have yeah. scheduled it later. Okay. They changed the and and keep in mind that there's always. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, and there is. There is something for uh, user error. <laughs> and you know what? If there is a problem, when you go to that showing, call the listing agent. They know that showings are going on because we get notified when everything is going on with that house. Call that listing agent and say, hey, I can't get in. Is, is there a secret to the front door? Is there a secret to the lock? This, this not combination number is not working. You know, give them a call. And... Um, Usually they can rectify it right away, but um, it, that's that's very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Did you have something? Yeah. Uh, with any kind of hinged lockbox, sentry lock, or combo, I would say either leave the front door open or close the lockbox because of the that screen door or whatever is going to slide and punch a hole in the glass with the screen. Yes. So when you're working with a hinged lockbox, make sure it's closed. Yeah. A because of the screen or the glass, and actually B, I've had houses that have had some damage from people closing the door, and it scrapes the whole inside of the door because of that lockbox. Actually, I'm going to say almost every house because of yeah. people leaving that that lockbox open. So try and be real mindful of that because we're showing the house. We don't want to wreck the house. And and see if you if you've not shown a house yet, <clears throat> see if you can practice on a sentry lock that's in the office and mm -hmm. practice, practice the lock box as well. Um, um, practice. You don't want to practice in front of your customers or clients. And there's all kinds of different lock boxes out there. So there's the sentry lock. There's the old school, I call it the high school combination. Turn it to the right three times, turn it to the left two times, and then back over. I hate those. Same. Um, there's the ones that have the numbers straight up and down that you have to line up the numbers, or sometimes they're sideways. There's the push button ones. You know, you have to push in the little, I don't, I don't know how old they are. Push the little buttons in. And what else is there? Is there anything else? There's the I'm sure there are. There's the numeral, there's the um, the letters. Um, I was going to do something that happened to me, which I thought about this class, and I was struggling on day. I had these buyers that I've known forever, and they wanted to look at a house in Mequon. And I pulled it up. I looked at it. I made the appointment. Um... Then I met them at that house and I'm going down into the cul-de-sac and I'm like, oh, that's weird. I didn't know there was two houses for sale on the cul-de-sac. Uh, okay. And then I looked and then I panicked. I looked at what they asked to see versus the one I made the appointment at. I made the appointment at the wrong house. So the one that they wanted to see was already under contract. I called and I said, I made a mistake and they kind of giggled and we went to look at it anyway, but so be careful. I've walked in on, I've walked into the wrong house. It was a oh. century lock yep. <laughs> and it was right down the street and I'm like, oh, a for sale sign. Lovely. Here we are. And you know, you work on autopilot sometimes when you have multiple yep. showings yep. in a row. So I'm like in the house waiting for the buyers and they text me like, where are you? I'm like, shit. I did it. Yeah. 
I, oh, yeah. I have gone to the house also. Same thing, Catherine. Yeah. They were like four away. And you are, you're on autopilot thinking, okay, this is what's going on. This is this house. And I walked in, I'm like, boy, this doesn't look anything like the pictures. <laughs> totally in the wrong house. And it was a century lock. So century lock opens anything. So you know what? It happens to everybody. Yeah. And if somebody says they've never done it, they're lying. I'm going to tell you right now, they're what lying. of houses then. Oh yeah. yeah. Then they're not, they don't work if they haven't ever done it. Yeah. <laughs> so don't feel bad. Shake it off. Kind of make yeah. a joke about it and say, you know, with everything moving so fast, yeah. um, I, I made a mistake and own up to it and drop it, keep it in your heart and move on. Don't dwell on it. Don't, just move on. Most buyers <laughs> laugh and they're like, ha, 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 Yeah. Uh, where are you? I have just another thing to add. I thought of, yes. You know, yes. when you have the buyers who watch way too much HGTV and <laughs> you know that their budget doesn't allow for, well, we'll just we'll knock that wall and then that wall and that wall. And all of a sudden they're knocking all the walls. I think just like kind of being that voice of reason to say like, it sounds like the bones of this house maybe aren't right. And you know, maybe if you were only knocking one wall down, I could see, but this could become a very expensive home if this is not what you're looking for kind of thing. I, I think you have to tell them that what you see on HGTV is just not what actually happens in real life. I also you know, that's that a lot of people that buy houses, they knock all the walls down inside. So I... I kind of keep my mouth shut. Um, you know, you guys can do whatever you want when you buy the house. Um, they're going to ask you, well, how much do you think that's going to cost? I really don't know. It depends if it's a supporting wall or not. You know. <clears throat> Connie, I yep. think that is coming from you. If I mute you, I'm going to mute you a lot. Now it's better, isn't it? Yeah. I have a quick question. Yes. Do you know if there's a website that where we could actually take a look at surveys of like the of particular properties? Only if they're on site. If they're in MLS, you can go to the village and see if they have a survey, but um, there, I don't believe that there is a site per se. Okay, thank you, Janine. You're welcome, honey. Who else? So um, Charles put in the um, chat section, who's responsible for procuring damages due to lock boxes? Janine? <laughs> um, well, ultimately it's gonna end up on the listing agent's hands, I would imagine. We've had a few, how are you gonna? <laughs> How are you going to uh, determine if it was what age? And do you really want to get into that conversation? Probably not, especially if you might be writing on their property tomorrow and you're in a competitive situation. You're not going to battle over a lockbox. I mean, we don't. We yeah. take ownership of it. Good question. Yep. Um, here's a question. Um, Oh, garage door getting open. This is off subject, but this is something that's really good from somebody who has a listing, so they're a newer agent. Do I have to send offers over as they are received? I told the sellers we would sit down on Sunday and re review them. Um, that's a really good question. So, and it's good for buyer agents to know this as well. I, it depends on who the audience is and what the situation is. If I'll have a discussion with them beforehand and say, we're going to probably get these offers before the four o'clock on Sunday deadline. Um, I can recap them as they come in and send them over to you. And then collectively at Sunday at four o'clock, we can review them as a whole and I'll have it on a spreadsheet. I kind of like to do it that way because 
if there's something in that offer that I send over prior to review time that the sellers are questioning me about, um, I can maybe go back to that buyer's agent and say, hey, I, we have your offer and I'm just wondering, is it possible that um, you change your closing date? It kind of makes things easier for when that four o'clock deadline comes in. I, I, I don't do them, but they may say, you know what, Bridget, I'm, um, we're gonna be on vacation and just send everything over at once and we can re review them then. Um, but I, I like to send them over as they come and I recap them. How about you, Connie? I do too. I, um, the one thing I do not do is tell the seller we are expecting an offer. Never, ever say anything until you have it in hand. It has happened to me numerous times that agents will say, oh, yeah, I'm writing an offer. It'll be over by tonight. And you get so excited that you want to tell the seller, yeah, I've got an offer coming. Don't say anything because it has happened to me numerous times that, oh, yeah, they changed their mind. Because I'll call and say, I just want to confirm that you didn't send it because I have not received it. You said you were sending it over. Oh, yeah, they changed their mind. Now, if you already told that seller, uh, <laughs> some of them already have the money spent. <laughs> So until it's in hand, never say, they're laughing. I'm not kidding. <laughs> got a check, man. <laughs> I got my new car. I got my vacation. I, you know, don't say anything until it is in hand. Exactly. <laughs> um, I send that day, if I'm, expect, if I'm expecting multiples or if I'm expecting one at the end of the day, I send it over with a recap. So I do an attachment and I'll, and I just put down all the important things. So um, offer price, closing date, earnest money, any inspections, um, whether they want you to pay for um, a warranty and any other little things that really make a difference. I just kind of bullet point them and say, we can discuss this later or we can discuss it in the morning so they know what's going on. So, um, and then when the, um, when the date is that you're presenting them all, then you can put it in a spreadsheet or what have you. Now you can do it in command, which is amazing. No, you want to, you want to give the, so the question is, are you better off not telling the listing agent you're writing an offer? Absolutely not. So what you want to do is when you're writing an offer, always, always, always call that listing agent and see what's going on. I actually just got two texts on a listing that I have. Um, what's going on with it? Do you have any offers? How strong is the interest? So call that agent. You can send a text if you want, but I prefer a personal phone call because you're making that personal connection again. You will probably be doing a deal with this person. You want to be on really, really good terms. Make that physical phone call. Um, yes. So as a buyer's agent, you're going to say, hey, Janine, it's Connie. I'm looking at your 123 Main Street. The showing went really, really well today. Do you have any offers or any other interest? Um, what, would the, what would the sellers like? What would make this deal go very, very smoothly? What, what are they looking for? They want to close on June 1st. You know, they'll tell you when that um, closing date needs to be, how long they need, if they need extra occupancy. So that's where that that listing agent is going to help you write that successful offer. If And I've received like mystery emails with offers. And I'm like, what is this? And it is nothing close to what the seller needs, wants, desires. So that one, I mean, you just wasted your time. Because we need to make that transaction good on both sides and make it good for the sellers as well as the buyers. So call and say, I will let you know when I send this over, my buyers are really considering it or we are writing off, whatever the case may be. But I always follow it up by, I will send you a text when I send this over. And we're very, very appreciative of that because I don't check my email every minute. But when my text goes off, I check that right away. And when you Janine, send how about you? 
offer, you want to text, email, and say, please confirm receipt. Confirm they have received that offer. Yep. Because so, with some emails, you may have one letter off and send it to the wrong person. And with some emails, it'll take a whole entire day to let you know that it didn't go through. So please, yeah, definitely, please confirm receipt. Okay, so what if you're a buyer's agent and the NMLS says that offers to be reached by seller Saturday at five o'clock, but you looked at it on Thursday night and you want a quick answer by that day? What do you do? On Thursday or on Saturday? On Thursday. <laughs> okay, it's happened to me. As yep. a listing agent, it will, I will put in there offers reviewed Saturday at noon, Thursday night. I get a call from an agent and said, we're going to write an offer and we would like binding acceptance tonight. And it's going to be so amazing that your buyer, your sellers are going to want to take it. So I am not the boss. I, re I submit that offer to the seller. That is my job. I don't hold it back. It's not working for the seller. The seller can do as they choose, even though it's an MLS. What I do then is I send out a notice through showing time that we have received an offer on the property with a short binding acceptance. And it alerts someone, shoot, if I'm going to write an offer, even though it said in MLS Saturday at noon, I need to let my buyers know because now they may have to write sooner, if at all. I don't love it, but typically that offer that comes through is so ridiculous that, you know, the sellers may decide, you know what, we're done. Yep. So Janine, yep. when you send out that message through MLS that you got an offer and it's amazing and this and that, that only goes to the people that have booked showings, correct? It's everyone that has shown the property. Right. You, yep. And then I call every single person that is going to show the property and let them know. And it's, okay. it's not fun. I mean, agents are upset. Um, but you have to do your job. You have well, to that's, do your that's why it's important as a, a buyer's agent, if this is a hot property to even call ahead of showing it, just to check if a situation like that happened, you know, because then at least you have a sense of urgency to share with your buyers. Right. Yep. I Next. have a question. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. This is like, mine's different. So oh, what I've been doing to try to like, get in front of the, the property just in general, um, when I book a showing, I always call the listing agent now and just say, Hey, you know, my buyers have lost out on several properties at this point. So, you know, I have a showing scheduled, but I also am just doing some due diligence because we have buyer fatigue at this point. So I'm vetting out the property for them. So tell me a little bit about the property, anything beyond the MLS that we should know. And usually that conversation opens up a floodgate of information that has been really helpful. Um, with the conversation and also helps us eliminate a property um, before even going. Um, the price point that I'm working in with a specific buyer, there's so much that's coming on the market, but it's still so competitive. So we're going out every single day. As soon as something comes on the market, they're like, let's go see it. And it's kind of a free for all too. Um, but I feel like calling that listing agent, talking about the stresses of the market from a listing agent and, you know, it just opens up that rapport a little bit. So I found that to be successful um, with, with the market. Yep. Hang on yep. a sec. Uh, Nick? Could you avoid the entire situation just by saying buyer acceptance no later than? And you put that date there and that way you can take anything before then. And there's no expectation that you're, you're that you're necessarily going to just bundle these all up as one big pile and show it to them. Can you say no later than, and then you can, then you don't have to do in MLS any of them. Yeah, in MLS. Uh, MLS, you have to watch your wording. Right. So it has to be as per the seller's request. Okay. Seller's request. Mm -hmm. 
tell them one second. What we would like to do is make sure that we don't have the nobody's putting by any sentence past here because we want to make sure our but would you like it if something comes in to just be able to take it off? Okay. So the question is, could you put in MLS seller requests binding acceptance no later than? Which means you are accepting anything up to that. Yeah. You could. You could, but I think you're that's yeah. no, I think that's kind of if you're saying that writing acceptance is for that day. Then people are expecting that they have a chance to show and a chance to offer by, you know, up to then. If you say no later than, yeah. then there's no expectation that theirs is necessarily going to be bundled in with the rest of the show because you're doing it, at, you know, you're yeah. doing the offers as they come up. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is very redundant to put, to put that verbiage. Yeah. yeah. I think that's redundant to put that, that, that verbiage in there because you're then you're better off just not putting anything at all. I have a question and it's going to sound kind of funny, but we know that cash offers are like great. And so let's say you're working with a buyer who's like, maybe like your friend. So you know them and you know, they have really rich parents, but their parents aren't buying them the house. They, they will be taking out a loan, but to win the house, do I just need like a snapshot of the parent's bank account? This sounds, I know I sound crazy. I'm trying to figure out, I guess, I think other people might be doing something like that. If you're confident, if the lender is confident, we know they're going to have enough time and a loan's going to go through if we put in this cash offer and do the loan. I understand that like, they can't get out of buying the house, they're bringing cash or the loan to closing. Um, do I just need like, how does proof of funds work for a cash offer? Right, so good you have, question. Yeah, that's a good question and it happens a lot. Um, I need proof of funds that there's money in the bank and if their parents are going to purchase it, um, I usually have the parents' proof of funds and the parents are writing that offer. I mean, I, I can't okay, just- Okay, so you can't, if it's like Bill Smith's bank account, but it's Teddy Smith, the son, you can't have Teddy Smith as buying the house, but the proof of funds says Bill or something. Well, unless Bill Smith is, you know, how do I know that Bill's daddy is actually going to give Teddy the money? Because you have the picture of their bank account. But does it mean that that's Teddy's or is that the dad's? I mean, uh -huh. just because Teddy has the money doesn't mean that daddy's going to be giving the money to Teddy. So, so do daddy, you mean that stand in that case, do you, so the parents buy, they basically write the offer and they put cash on the property. And then do the parents and the kids figure out a way to make the loan happen? privately with them and then the loan has nothing to do with the house essentially yep. Yep. or you know they can be co-buying the house the parent right. and the child yep so teddy and bill smith could be purchasing the home yep and bill smith has the cash and teddy's name is on on the, on the um, on offer yep because if, if you do it with the parents buying the property, can you still get the kids on the title? You just have to coordinate with title during that period? Yep. So yeah. the offer being written would be for Teddy and Bill Smith. Got it. You have to show proof of funds at the particular date. So what if the parents switched, you know, put the funds in the kid's account, show proof of funds, is that sufficient um, to make it so the child can purchase the home? These are all really good questions. Um, proof of funds, as it's written in the offer to purchase, proof of funds must be, um, you know, the secured funds must be shown, if you will, within seven days of accepted offer. So there needs to be a letter from the bank that yep. says that the funds are 
available for the purchase within seven days of an accepted offer. I think there's also something about um, those, like if mom and dad just give them a bunch of cash, it has to be living in that child's bank account for a specific period of time um, so that it's actually proven it's their funds too. Well, that's if you're taking out a loan. Right. Because if you're going through the bank, the bank wants to see 60 days of your bank account. So there ha that money has to be in that account for 60 days in order for the loan to be approved. Right. So when it comes to cash offers, I mean, it, that's just one of those tricky things. If, if, if it were my buyers, I mean, you have to sit down, you have to have a talk with them and see you know, where this is coming from, how it's being done, but most likely you would have the parents and the child's name on it. But um, that's that's something to be working out with the buyers. If that makes sense to everybody. Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else about house showings? We're good. Okay, last but not least, and Charlie's been bringing this up every week, is feedback. It is your job to supply feedback for that house, period. Done. What kind of show, what kind of feedback you put, this is where the question is. Keep in mind that the sellers are receiving that feedback. Be nice, but put some facts in. Because if everybody puts, it's a great house, it's priced right, and they don't have any offers, it doesn't help the seller's agent and it doesn't help the sellers to sell that house. So um, paint colors are too dark. It makes the house appear to be small is a nice one. Um, yard needs work. It was hard to see the basement because of all the clutter. I mean, these are all okay things. Kitchen is too small for these buyers. Buyers did not um, like the layout. Uh, buyers did not like the layout of the house. The bedrooms are too small. These are all things that you can definitely put in. Um, buyers were looking for updated bathrooms. You know, be specific and tell people, you know, why your buyers didn't like that house. Because keep in mind, they are forwarded to the sellers. Okay. Um, anything that anybody's seen in the house that their buyers really didn't like? What are some good examples that you would put in your feedback? Smell of views. The smell. Okay. Okay. So additions that were done by the sellers. Um, handyman work is another one that I've seen. Anybody else? Street. Anything in the street? Pardon? Busy street. Yeah. A busy street. You know, some of these things you can't see when you're looking at the property. It's, it's a busy street. I have small children. That's okay. Put that on the feedback because the sellers really do want to know. Anybody else? So when do you do that feedback? Because everybody gets that email within 30 minutes of that showing. Right as on. soon as you can. Please do that as soon as you can the day of. Don't wait until the second email. Don't wait until the third email. And I've had people who never, ever give feedback. And I personally called them and they said, we are so busy. And I said, I understand, but we owe it to my sellers to get feedback. So please do that feedback within the day of your showing. And keep in mind that it does go to the sellers. Put in things that, you know, maybe they could improve. Yep. Yep. Buyers are not interested in all. We will not be making an offer. That's okay. I am totally on mute. Nope. There we go. Um, another thing to put in there, you know, if it's cluttered, it was really hard to um, make out the value of the house because of the clutter. Some, some houses are really, really dirty. Don't put, it's a pig pen, but <laughs> even though you would like to, it, you know, there's there's a lot of clutter to get around. And a lot of times when people put in, um, you know, what could we do to this house to make it sell? 
uh, clear out the clutter. You know, pack rats, sometimes houses are absolutely beautiful. And if there were a lot of people there, I've also had feedback from sellers that say, or sellers, excuse me, buyer's agents that say, my um, buyers just are not up for the competition, which is really, really sad, okay? So if you are showing a property for someone else and they made um, that appointment, that buyer's agent who you're helping out will get that feedback. So as a sub agent, let's say, please get back to the buyer's agent and let them know so they can fill out that feedback. Like I said, it's really, really important and the sellers expect it, okay? Any other questions? Uh, I'm looking at my notes here real quick. Any other questions about showing a house? I know it was kind of long and drawn out, but hopefully everybody took a couple of notes. Um, you're gonna do a couple question. of things. One question. Pardon? One yeah. question. If you're like the last showing of the day, do yep. you typically turn all the lights off or like, should I reach out to the listing agent and ask if she wants me to or that kind of thing? That's a great question. So if you're the last showing of the day, how do you know? <laughs> you can call the listing agent. Sometimes they want all the lights left on and the, and the um, sellers will turn off the lights. I have gotten emails or texts from the listing agent that says, you are the last showing, can you please turn off all the lights? So if they were on when I walked in, I usually leave them on. Unless if it says in the notes, keep in mind when you do a showing, you get notes on showing time, please turn off all lights and remove shoes or wear booties. So just follow those instructions on showing time. Make sure you look at them. Sometimes people want all the lights left on. I had one listing that I had back to back to backs and I just stopped in just because I do. I stopped and all the lights are off. I'm like, oh, for the love. And then I stopped in two hours later and all the lights were off again. And I, it specifically said on there, because the sellers wanted everything on. The less touching, the better. They're, they're a little freakish about things. Well, every time I went, the damn lights were off. <laughs> so I had to turn them on. And it was right in showing time. Please leave all lights on. Remove shoes or wear booties. Limit touching, you know, it's loosening up a lot more now. But um, we'll see where it goes. Great points. Great, great points. Um, so a month ago, and it was a long time ago, a month ago, we um, were working on building our database and we were to call 20 people a day. How are we doing on that? Not good? Kind of good? Okay, everybody just pulled their hats over their eyes. Seriously? <laughs> I'm getting a lot of this right now. <laughs> eyes up here. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna bring it all back today. I want everybody to make 20 contacts. Here's your scapegoat. Everybody's on spring break. I want you to leave a message. Everybody contact 20 people and leave a message. Happy spring, if they're religious, let's go into Easter. If they're not, it's 32 degrees today. It's gonna to be 70 on Sunday. Spring is here. I just want to wish you a happy spring. Tulips are coming up. Let me know if your neighbor wants to sell their house. Make it simple. Make it easy. Leave a message. 20 contacts today for your lead gen, please. And Garen knows that I do make phone calls. So there's that. <laughs> he stopped answering my call. I'm not answering her anymore. She's going to call to see if I made him. Yeah. <laughs> so um, any other questions about showing a house? Everybody has notes, hopefully. Everybody has gained a couple things on what to do, what not to do. I'm sure there's more out there. It's only Janine and I. Everybody does something a little bit different. But um, everybody have a great Easter. Um, go Brewers, opening day, if anybody's going. And we will see you guys next week. Next week, we are going to go over a daily schedule, what you should be doing on a daily. Because I know when you first start, you're kind of lost. Like, okay, I'm my own boss. I'm in a new business and I don't know what to do. So we're going to go over a daily schedule for you guys, how to start your day, where to move on, where to block some time off for yourself. Because you can work from seven in the morning until eight o'clock at night, but you need to book a little bit of time off for yourself and um, working into a little bit more lead gen. 
So if we have no more questions, you guys have a great day and um, happy Easter. Thank you. Thank you. See you all next week. Happy Easter. Thank you.